Thank you for joining us. With so much confusion worldwide and misinformation, the need for people everywhere to be in touch with truth and reality is far greater than ever. Jonathan Davis is Vice President for External Relations at the IDC, Interdisciplinary Center, which is Israel's first private university. He also heads the Rafael Ricanati International School, an institute for counterterrorism, and also serves as a lieutenant colonel in the IDF spokesman's office. Right there with Jonathan Davis, we also have Nitzan Siegel to conduct this interview, especially because she lived all her life on a kibbutz next to the Gaza Strip, and she sees the truth and reality firsthand. But first, we have these messages. Life Extension magazine brings you new discoveries in health and anti-aging. Our science-based research and supplements are so advanced, they're many years ahead of the medical mainstream with quality control standards that exceed FDA mandates. Life Extension has covered groundbreaking medical research for more than 35 years. For your health and future, you deserve the best. Learn more at lifeextension.com. Joining us now from Israel is Jonathan Davis and Nitzan Siegel. It's such a pleasure to have you with us on the other side of the world. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Nice to be here. Thank you, sir. I would actually like to ask Nitzan to present you with a first question. So please, Nitzan, go ahead. Well, Jonathan, you're the Dean of the International School in the IDC in Ertzelia. Your name in Israel walks before you. Can you tell us more about this international school, what its mission is, what is it from your perspective? Okay, from my perspective, I'm really pleased to tell you that the Israeli Minister of Education changed the name of our illustrious university from IDC, which you just mentioned, to Reichman University, and that took place uh, last week. So that's an amazing situation. It's the first time in the history of the State of Israel that a non-subsidized college becomes anointed by our Minister of Education to basically be a private university in this country. That's a, a, it's a very big statement because when it comes to free enterprise and when it comes to capitalism and when it comes to uh, basically uh, anything to do with uh, being an entrepreneur, this makes uh, a huge difference for all of us. So that's number one. Um, and so we're celebrating this week, having become the first private university in the country. It's called Reichman University. And this university is basically based on the philosophy. Uh, our mission statement basically is, what can we do best for the state of Israel? And how can we best raise future leaders for the state of Israel, or the Jewish world, or the world at large? Congratulations. Sir, you've always been involved in historic aspects of the history of the state of Israel. Perhaps you'd like to share with us a little bit about your personal past. Uh, well, okay. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure uh, being part of this milestone at Reichman University. Before that, I basically immigrated to Israel about 50 years ago. So about uh, 50 years ago, I was a student at Columbia University. I came to study at the Hebrew University. And before I could say Jack Robinson, when I completed my studies at the Hebrew University, I joined the Israel Defense Force in a paratrooper reconnaissance unit. I fought during the Yom Kippur War. We were on a number of very interesting missions on the Iraqi-Syrian border under the leadership of then Captain Shaul Mofaz, who many years later became the Chief of Staff and the Minister of Defense of the State of Israel. Um, after that, I worked at, at a number of uh, places in Israel. I, I was a civil servant for the Jewish Agency for Israel and found myself being an emissary for Israel in South Africa, in the United States of America, in Rome, Italy, and behind the Iron Curtain, when we had no diplomatic relations uh, with that part of the world, I was going into the former Soviet Union and meeting with uh, 
Jewish activists relatively clandestinely um, in order to get them to be very excited about Zionist values and about one day being able to, to fulfill the good deed of immigrating to Israel from the former Soviet Union. And that was a very important uh, part of the history. Another part, part of history was that I was involved with the rescue of Ethiopian Jewry um, in the 1990s and later, in, uh, a, a number of years later as well, both with Operation Moses and Operation Solomon. And for the past 21 years, I've been on this campus, which has been a great way to uh, continue that chapter. Absolutely fascinating, sir. Enough material for a mini-series on television. But I'd like to point out that Nitsan beside you uh, is a little younger, and she has experienced all her life living on the Gaza border and is an officer in the IDF. And it's interesting to see your two perspectives. Go ahead, Nitsan. Well, the IDC or university um, educates young leaders from all over the globe, different cultures, different religions, different countries. And in our reality, the one that I've been living and most of Israelis have been living, the wide variety has a great potential. Do you see any responsibility that you believe they have? Well, we're very, very pleased to, uh, to have uh, 2,100 students in our international school, in the Rafael Reconati International School of Reichman University. They come from 90 different countries um, around the world. Our, our uh, mission statement here is a humanistic Zionist mission statement I would say we base our values on Herzl, Jabotinsky, Ben-Gurion, and Menachem Begin in the sense that we believe in the Jewish and democratic state of Israel, but also in Zionist values. So you will find a very, very large number of students on this campus who are former combat officer, officers in the IDF, uh, just like you, Nitzan, okay? Imagine taking a ho hundreds of Nitzans, okay, <laughs> and placing them at Reichman University Okay, and from those fantastic people, we choose the, the future leaders of the state of Israel, of the Jewish world, or the world at large. And I can tell you that we also have on this campus uh, officers of the American Armed Forces who come and study counterterrorism here. And so we therefore have uh, leaders from all over the world and all kinds of individuals, which leads me, by the way, to... Uh, to think very much in terms of the United States where I grew up many years of my life. So we have to make sure that we are, are the bastions of freedom and democracy around here. And so that the Nitzans of this world will become the future leaders of the state of Israel. And you have a platform, right? Um, to make them sort of informal ambassadors. Uh, we have a platform which basically educates the students here to become uh, great students. Uh, to become great academics. Uh, we teach any number of uh, different areas around here, such as business and business and economics and entrepreneurship and computer science and psychology and government and counterterrorism and diplomacy and psychology and, and, and so many other things around here in an interdisciplinary fashion. And that's what we teach inside the classroom. And outside the classroom, there are a lot of extracurricular activities where people can learn how to become future leaders. So we have an ambassadors club here, and we have a model United Nations here, and we have uh, any number of areas where you can learn how to, how to debate and make the case for what you uh, believe in. We even, uh, we even have situations here where if God forbid, there are actions taking place in, in the Middle East, many of our students get behind the uh, their laptops and, and get behind their iPhones and are able to make the case for Israel in a hurry. And they make the case for Israel basically without hesitation. Well, recent events in the Middle East, they had a great impact on the world's perception of Israel and how they see us. And as you just said, your students, they take, they take action and they do things. And I, I would like you to elaborate more about that in what ways they can contribute and well, what benefit does it have that they have so many cultural vari varieties here? I, I think what's really important is that when our students have Zionist values, 
which they believe in, and it doesn't have necessarily anything to do with any personal political belief they have. They can be from different uh, parts of the, of the camp. Uh, but the main thing is Zionist values. So people like Nitzan, okay, when Nitzan sees that her kibbutz, okay, is being rocketed um, on, on the Gaza border and that people's lives might be lost there, that's basically an act of terrorism. That is uh, terrorists firing rockets in order to try and murder innocent civilians, which is basically the definition of terrorism which we've encountered in this country. So it's pretty simple when you believe in these values, and you can come, by the way, from different backgrounds, but still believe in these values. You can be a Christian Zionist. You can be, by the way, a person who believes in Zionist principles and come from the Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the Shinto world. We have people here from different backgrounds on campus, some of, the, some of whom are not even uh, Jewish, who, who believe in these areas. I think it's important for a student who doesn't have any other particular agenda other than tell the story of what's happening in this region. They can tell the story about Israel being a Jewish and democratic state. They can say, well, they, someone, somebody could test us and say, well, why do you think you're democratic? So we could say, well, we think we're democratic because we have people of different religions and backgrounds who are members of our parliament and have a vote, or that because Israeli citizens have a vote, or because uh, this country has, uh, is very, very uh, heterogeneous in the way it thinks, and we allow people the right to debate, and we allow people freedom of speech, and we allow people the right to uh, congregate and, and protest against something they, they don't believe in. We're very egalitarian in this country as well. Speaking of freedom of speech, I'd like your view, both of you, on the phenomena of the, of the irresponsibility of mass media and social media in distorting the facts, lying by omission, and how you both, from your different perspectives, see this practice of anti-Semitism and misinformation and how dangerous it is in a world that is gullible and so easily ignorant. Well, we also teach communications at Reichman University. And uh, we teach our students, we have a radio station here, and we have a TV studio here, and we, have, we teach the students interactive skills. One of the things we teach our students, especially in the new media and the social media, is how much fake news uh, there can actually be, and how people can make things up that never existed. So today, if you wish to be a Holocaust denier, you can deny the Holocaust. And the social, me and the social media allows you a tremendous amount of leeway to deny the Holocaust or to be an anti-Zionist or to be an anti-Semite, which is sometimes part of the same thing. So it is tantamount and most important for students who have leadership skills to get on the social media and make the case for Israel, not in some kind of an extreme fashion, not to try and steal the show, just actually to tell the truth of what it's like to be a 24-year-old, or a 26-year-old, or a 28-year-old. Some of these people may have been under fire in combat before, uh, but some of them may have been students in China before. And some of these students might come from India, and they might come from other countries. And now they're living in Israel, and they're experiencing what happens in this country. When someone says Israel is this kind of a country or that kind of a country in a nasty kind of way. Well, since they live here, and since they... Uh, witness what's happening, all they've got to do is speak about what they see in front of them when Israel's attacked or when Israel's not attacked, uh, just to discuss the realities on the ground. I think in this reality of misinformation and anti-Semitic undertones, we can have a great impact as young students, especially bilingual students and a variety of different cultures and countries. This has a great power, and as um, Jonathan just said, the fight is when you just tell the right information instead of fight against the wrong and the misinformation. And I think that's a very good cause that they have here and a very good platform. Well, I think we have the advantage of being able to make the case for Israel in Norwegian, Swedish, Finnish, Danish, 
German from Germany, German from Switzerland, French from France, French from Belgium, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, Chinese, Koreans, and so many other languages, uh, which we can make the case in, Russian, East European languages, and so on and so forth. And all of these students are here under the umbrella of actually studying here and experiencing uh, life in the country and being able to basically express themselves. I think one thing which is to our advantage is that there are some very, very extremist groups who thrive on disinformation and misinformation who are so extreme that they actually begin to scare the silent majority who begin to wonder, who are these guys? So when we answer these very, very extreme groups in a moderate way, in what we call in Yiddish, in a menschlich way, okay? Not trying to attack them personally, not trying to score points on their fake news, but just basically in the Churchillian manner of just being able to discuss, even sometimes in an undertone, what the facts really are. Sir, you mentioned a case for Israel. It so happened two days ago, I interviewed the author of this book, A Case for Israel, my friend Alan Dershowitz. And he told me, actually on camera, how friends of his ostracize him today and blackball him because he tries to be fair and impartial in his interpretation of the Constitution here in the United States. In fact, he mentioned how the entertainer, who I thought was always a rather funny clown, was an old friend of his, attacked him in a cafe just recently, shouted at him, and was really being quite obnoxious, as if a clown's view has any real merit, frankly, as to my question. But anyway, so Alan said, it's about the Constitution, stupid. But even Alan Dershowitz can be persecuted by ignorant individuals, even famous ones. You know, Richard, interesting that you should bring up uh, Professor Alan Dershowitz uh, for the very simple reason that every book he's ever written is in my library in the office and staring at me <laughs> on a daily basis. Secondly, we invited Professor Dershowitz to teach in our law school over here, and we're very, very proud to have had him as a teacher here. Professor Dershowitz has also addressed our annual Herzliya conference and our annual Institute for Counterterrorism conference as well. And Professor Dershowitz is the kind of individual who just calls the shots as he sees them in a normative fashion and is not trying to become a populist. He is merely trying to be the professor of constitutional law, which he is, and the constitutional lawyer, which he is. And the other interesting thing about certain people who are very opinionated, also at universities at times, by the way, and also in other parts of the community of the United States, is the fact that they, all, they frequently believe in freedom of speech as long as you agree with what they're saying. And if you don't agree with what they're saying, then you should be trampled on. Trampled on at a local restaurant you happen to be attending or trampled on at a cocktail party, or made to feel that you're not a good person. You're not a good person because you don't agree with what they believe in. That is not the freedom of speech and freedom of expression which we believe in at, at, at this university. It's also not the freedom of speech and freedom of expression which the Constitution of the United States of America believes in. Everybody should have the right to express themselves. And other than terrorists who wish to express themselves by murdering someone, people should be tolerant of other people and hear other people's views. By the way, the Zionist movement was created by hearing the views of left-wing Zionism, of middle-of-the-road Zionism, of right-wing Zionism, of secular Zionism, and of religious Zionism. And at least we, as citizens of this country, we're very argumentative. Our TV shows are argumentative. I'd like to think that even though we express ourselves sometimes extremely with great passion. I would like to also think, though, that we are also willing to hear each other. And, and, and as crazy as things can sometimes get in this Jewish and democratic state, 
What you're saying to me about Professor Dershowitz is very, very disturbing because even though you can be passionate about your views, you need to behave like a mensch. And, and those people who speak to Professor Dershowitz in such a way were probably never really his friends to begin with. This is all very interesting. I had no idea. And yeah, he's a friend of mine. We just did a TV show on cancel culture. They're canceling Dershowitz. I'll tell you something, Richard. You can't cancel chicken soup. And you can't cancel Dershowitz. <laughs> and you can't cancel good Kanedelach, okay, on Pesach. And ca you can't cancel apple and honey on Rosh Hashanah. And Dershowitz is a believer of Zionist values no less than Herzl and Jabotinsky and Ben-Gurion and Menachem Begin and the founder of, of Reichman University, Professor Uriel Reichman. That's the way it is. So the people who wish to become fundamentalists and cancel culture, I think that's very, very fundamentalist. I think it's something which, in my opinion, is dangerous. We certainly would not wish to cancel the sources of Zionist values. And part of humanistic Zionist values, by the way, are that it's a Jewish and democratic state by the people, for the people, with the minority in mind. And that can be a Muslim minority, or a Christian minority, or a Buddhist minority. But all of those people who live in this country will have the same citizenship and the same rights which we have here. And we will hear them out. And if they want to demonstrate against something, we will listen to them and we will hear them out. And right now, the Prime Minister of Israel who lives in Ranana, in his specific neighborhood, there are hundreds of people protesting against him every night. And the police allow those people to protest in spite of the fact that they make a lot of noise for the neighbors. And they can say practically anything they want to say unless they want to scream fire in a theater, okay, and then uh, possibly endanger the lives of the people in the theater, which is part of the way the American Constitution sees it and the way the Israeli Declaration of Independence sees it, since Israel and the United States are partners when it comes to democratic and constitutional values. Well, even though we have to conclude, I'm very glad that uh, you brought uh, Nitsan to our attention. It's always nice uh, to have guests here from small communities in the Gaza periphery who were combat officers in the IDF and can speak on behalf of Israeli youth and, his, and Israeli leadership. And even though the, the show's up, uh, Richard, you know, we're still youngsters, you and me. I uh, said, so we have a, still have a few years to go. And if you want to schmooze in the future, here we are. It will be my honor to come and schmooze with you in person. Definitely, sir. Love to have you with us, Richard. Jonathan, is, it is a pleasure having you here, and thank you for taking the time. And with that said, is, if there is any message you would like to give our viewers or students and parents all over the world. Well, it's a pleasure that uh, Richard had you come to Reichman University from a small place outside of Gaza, former combat officer. We can't think of a better person to present Israel on Richard's show than someone such as you. I'd like to thank Richard for his show because basically he gives Israel the opportunity of, of expressing themselves with uh, so many viewers, uh, which he has. And I would like to invite any parents out there who may wish to send their kids to study at Reichman University. They can study an array of different subjects um, in the English language. We are fully approved by the Council for Higher Education in Israel. Many of our students who come here to do an undergraduate degree continue their graduate degrees in the United States. Some end up staying in Israel. Some end up going back to their countries of origin and become great ambassadors there. So thank you for giving us the opportunity of, uh, of saying our piece. It is our honor, our duty, and my personal pleasure. Thank you both so very, very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. In 1994, the Dean of the Faculty of Law at Tel Aviv University decides to leave his senior position. At an abandoned military base in the heart of Herzliya, he dreams of establishing the first academic institution of its kind in the state of Israel. 
an independent, multidisciplinary, broad-minded, convention-breaking academic institution. A place that fosters freedom of thought and encourages self-realization. <laughs> Many partners join in the vision, and the pastoral campus is filled with more and more new schools, labs and research institutes, TV and radio studios, classrooms, groundbreaking programs, and thousands of young people with a spark in their eyes. IDC Herzliya is becoming one of the most sought-after academic institutions in Israel and abroad, with students from over 90 countries around the world. Within a few years, one man's dream has become a reality that couldn't have been imagined. From an abandoned base to the first private university in Israel, home to thousands of researchers and students from Israel and the world. An extensive network of tens of thousands of graduates serving in key positions in the workforce, in both public and private sectors, and leading countless groundbreaking initiatives. A vibrant academic institution with deeply rooted values and a gaze that looks far beyond the horizon. ויותר כבר לא צריך לשאול, אני בא ללמוד ממה שטוב ולחיות. להתחיל הכל מההתחלה, כמו לנשום בפעם הראשונה, אני כאן, אני לא מתבזבז יותר. עשרים וחמש שנות חיי האחרונות הקדשתי לבן תחומי. כשאני רואה אתכם כאן, בערב המקסים הזה, עם המשפחות שלכם, אני מרגיש שמילאתי שליחות ושהכול היה כדאי. This concludes our special show for today from On Location in Israel. I'm Richard Peretz. Thank you for being with us. Thank mm -hmm. you.